Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, time is running out for lawmakers. Tonight we'll tell you about some of the bills coming in under the wire, including one that could shake up law and order in California. What started with bribes to get into college is ending with a prison sentence. Here are the sentence for an A-list actress caught up in the scandal. And that's one of the things we don't know about this illness, is really what are the long-term effects? A growing public health warning over vaping. We learn more about illnesses popping up here in San Diego as a major vape company faces a lawsuit. And a behind-the-scenes look at how an orphaned otter is being cared for by a local animal rescue team. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening. It's Friday, September 13th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. The clock is ticking tonight in Sacramento. If lawmakers plan to pass any new bills this year, it needs to happen today. This is the final day of work for the legislature. The week started with hundreds of bills still up for a vote, with issues including law enforcement, the environment, and a controversial vaccination bill approved this week. The focus now shifts to Governor Gavin Newsom. He has until October 13th to sign or veto each bill. And that includes a plan to make for-profit prisons a thing of the past. KPBS reporter Max Rivlin-Nadler tells us more. There are four large detention centers that are privately run for immigration detainees across the state. They can hold up to 4,500 people at a time. One of the largest facilities is run by the company Core Civic in Otay Mesa. It can hold up to 1,500 people and is currently in the midst of an expansion. Under the new law, a facility like this would no longer be allowed to operate within the state. Immigration advocates applauded the bill, which will also ban the use of private detention for people in the state prison system as well. Jackie Gonzalez is the policy director for California Collaborative for Immigrant Justice, which helped push for the bill. She believes that the increased detention of migrants is driven by profit motive. Detention nationwide is at an all-time high um, because one of the principal factors is the financial incentive uh, to detain immigrants. I mean, we saw that when private prison stocks went up 100 uh, percent, you know, with Trump's election and the rate of immigrant detention has grown under this administration. Advocates believe that instead of shifting detainees to government-run facilities, ICE could simply release them like many other immigrants facing possible deportation. In a statement, a spokesperson for Core Civic told told KPBS that the company helps relieve the strain of a large detention population on local governments and that, quote, attempts to eliminate options for other governments in crisis are misguided. Assemblymember Rob Bonta wrote the bill. His office tells KPBS that AB 32 does in fact cover this detention facility here in Otay Mesa. As of January 1st, 2020, no contract will be able to be signed or renewed between Immigration and Customs Enforcement and Core Civic. In Otay Mesa, Max Rivlin Nadler, KPBS News. There are other noteworthy bills passed by the legislature in the final days of its session. The Body Camera Accountability Act bans law enforcement from using facial recognition tech on its body cameras. The Tenant Protection Act limits most annual rent increases to 5% plus inflation. And the Fair Pay to Play Act opens the door for college student athletes to pursue paid sponsorships. It's a national scandal that's ensnared parents and a university here in San Diego. And today, an Emmy-winning actress was sentenced for her part, rigging college admissions. Kelly Smoot has more from Boston. In a Boston courtroom today, Felicity Huffman was sentenced to 14 days in prison. Huffman pleaded guilty in May to conspiracy to commit mail fraud and honest services mail fraud. Earlier this month, she sent a letter to the judge in which she said, quote, I have a deep and abiding shame over what I have done, shame and regret that I will carry for the rest of my life. The former Desperate Housewives star admitted that she paid $15,000 for a proctor to boost her oldest daughter's SAT scores. More than 50 people, including parents, coaches, and test administrators were charged in Operation Varsity Blues, the largest college admissions cheating scheme ever prosecuted, according to the Department of Justice. We have charged three people who organized these scams, two SAT or ACT exam administrators, one exam proctor, one college administrator, nine coaches at elite schools, and 33 parents 
who paid enormous sums to guarantee their children's admission to certain schools through the use of bribes and fake academic and athletic credentials. Huffman is the first parent to be sentenced in the college admission scandal. Former Stanford head sailing coach John Vandemore was sentenced to two years supervised release and a $10,000 fine. Kelly Smoot, KPBS News. $11 billion, that's how much Pacific Gas and Electric is going to pay for its involvement in the deadly campfire in the northern California town of Paradise. The money will go to a group of insurance companies representing most of the claims. 86 people died in that fire. The $11 billion is well below the $20 billion the insurance companies had sought in bankruptcy court. The nation's top e-cigarette maker is facing a lawsuit related to a case of lung disease. Attorneys for a teen in Illinois are suing Juul Labs. The company is accused of deliberately marketing to young people and that it doesn't fully disclose that its products contain dangerous chemicals. The company response is that it never marketed to youth and that it tries to combat underage use. Another death attributed to the national outbreak of an unusual vaping-related illness here in San Diego. There have been 12 confirmed cases with no deaths. KPBS health reporter Taryn Mento examines what's being done to treat the disease while working to solve the mystery. Well, Dr. McDonald, thank you for speaking with me. It's my pleasure. What's the latest on the cases in San Diego? Well, it's an interesting illness because it's not reportable. It's not one of the ones we'd known about until recently. But one of the things that is supposed to be reported is unusual diseases, and that's exactly what this is. We have 12 cases that have been reported so far in San Diego. They range in age from 17 to 70, with the median at about 38, which is a little older than some of the cases across the rest of the country. They re uh, the rest of the country is reporting a lot of uh, teenagers and young adults. Are these patients still currently hospitalized? Are all 12 currently in the hospital? Have some be, been released? There was one patient that had to be readmitted to the hospital. And that's one of the things we don't know about this illness is really what are the long-term effects? Certainly there's some dramatic short-term effects where individuals are hospitalized, put in the intensive care unit, uh, sometimes put on breathing machines, as has happened here in San Diego. Uh, but that's the short-term problem. Nobody really knows what the long-term problems, uh, both of this syndrome and, frankly, of using these vaping products might be. Why don't we know yet what's causing this? That's a great question. Uh, the, and the, the, the sort of follow-on is, how long has this really been going on? I mean, is it just something that, because some doctors noticed it and published it, uh, and other doctors started looking, that we're seeing something that was always there? Uh, or are, are the numbers of people who are vaping just getting to a critical mass that an un uncommon result of vaping is now showing up more frequently? Or is there something new being introduced into different vaping products uh, that is in fact causing these? It could be any or all of those. We have been able to get samples from two of our 12 patients in San Diego and sent those samples up to the state cannabis um, uh, 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 laboratory at uh, the uh, Department of Public Health. Some of the uh, laboratories across the country have noted that some of the cannabis products have had vitamin E in them. And that's not something that you would normally expect to find. Now the question is, is that related or is that just a red herring? And we don't really know until we can connect all the dots. You just said that uh, samples from two of the 12 patients that we sent to the state, is that the county's main role? Just uh, you know, a, a middleman here? Or is, are you doing more on the ground, asking questions, collecting data, and doing your own investigation? Well, uh, it's a little bit of both. This is a national investigation, and they uh, have established a national database with standard questions that all of the local jurisdictions are feeding up to the CDC, because sometimes you need large numbers of cases to uh, understand small details that, that might be able to crack the case, so to speak. But for our individual cases here in San Diego, they have to be interviewed, they have to be looked into. We ask if they've got product available, and again, in two of the cases, we were able to, to identify those, uh, have those routed through our public health lab to the state lab, and of course, we track all of that information uh, and uh, give feedback to the providers, in fact, if we find things. Other than knowing that all of our cases uh, bought products that were cannabinoid products, and knowing that many of them bought it from pop-up shops or over the internet, which is something that we're trying to counsel against, 
we haven't seen any other specific commonalities between our patients. Anything I missed that I didn't ask? The, the signs and symptoms people have of these illnesses, uh, it turns out that it's not just uh, respiratory symptoms people have. Um, some of the initial symptoms people have after vaping can be uh, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and diarrhea, leading then to um, respiratory symptoms of cough and shortness of breath. And so one of the messages we have is if you have those kinds of symptoms and you're seeking medical care, which you should, um, you should tell your doctor about all the things that you do, uh, the nutritional supplements you take, the medications that you're on, and the products that you might be using in vaping because it might actually affect what your doctor thinks of in terms of what may be causing your symptoms. Well, thank you very much for your time, Dr. McDonald. Oh, it's my pleasure. Yeah. I'm Judy Woodruff tonight on the News Hour. 16 year old activist Greta Thunberg on her call to take on climate change. Coming up at 7 after Evening Edition on KPBS. A federal study on honeybees will be back buzzing again. The U.S. Department of Agriculture stopped the work due to Trump administration cutbacks. Scientists had been tracking the 13-year steady decline of the bees who pollinate a third of all of the food that we eat. The, the bees are under threat from parasites and widespread pesticide use as well as climate change. SeaWorld has welcomed a new baby into its care. Cinder, the five-week-old otter, was orphaned and abandoned off the coast of Alaska, and now she's recovering right here in San Diego. KPBS science and technology reporter Shalina Chetlani got a chance to meet the pup. It's feeding time for five-week-old Cinder, who's lounging in a SeaWorld nursery pool. And boy, is she hungry. On the menu for today is a cinder favorite, lukewarm Pedialyte mixed with pulverized shrimp and clams. Uh, just like you would with a human baby, we introduced different types of food, um, not all at once. So one thing at a time, one item at a time. And once she adapts to eating the clams and the, the shrimp, we'll add another type of food, maybe squid or a type of fish called capelin. Cinder was separated from her mom near Homer, Alaska, and was found squished up against some rocks. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service decided she ought to be rehabilitated here at SeaWorld San Diego. Bill Hoffman of SeaWorld is one of Cinder's caretakers. An otter this young that's separated from mom and has to be re uh, handled and raised by humans is not going to be a good candidate to be re-released. They would not know how to take care of themselves in a in a wild environment. Hoffman says SeaWorld is equipped to rehabilitate otters. In fact, four others, southern otters, have been rescued as pups and taken care of here, like Coco, Emoka, Clover, and Pumpkin. This facility was built to take care of otters, and it was designed to display otters for educational purposes, but also raise otters in this nursery. So everything you see here was designed with this specific goal in mind. Hoffman says SeaWorld has rescued over 36,000 marine mammals since it opened 55 years ago. He says visitors may be able to take a peek at Baby Cinder through the nursery windows as early as next week. Shalina Chatlani, KPBS News. The hottest July on record. Fallen prey to the drought. Devastated by wildfires. Greenhouse gas emissions. Threatened by sea level rise. Our climate is changing and time is running out to fix it. KPBS brings you special coverage of San Diego's climate crisis. Learn how a warming climate will impact you, your neighborhood, and your world. Check out San Diego's climate crisis daily on KPBS TV, radio, and kpbs.org. A major brand is pulling its electric bikes and scooters out of San Diego. Uber says it will no longer rent its scooters or jump branded bikes in the city. The only exception is on local Navy bases. The move is in response to new fees and rules imposed by the city. Those include an agreement on data sharing along with speed and parking restrictions. The iPhone is overshadowed by a new Apple product, a shakeup in California's gig economy, and Zillow wants to buy your home. Priya Shreether and Miro Kopik cover it all in the Friday Business Report. All right, we're here with marketing strategist Miro Kopik from SDSU and Bottom Line Marketing. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Priya. All right, so let's start with Apple. It just had its big reveal event, and while new iPhones are usually the headline of those events, that wasn't the case this year, right? What direction is the company heading in here? 
Well, the company, uh, other than, than their new iPhone 11, is $50 cheaper than the iPhone X from last year, which is big news for consumers. The big news is actually Apple TV+. Plus. They launched their new uh, streaming service um, uh, with big fanfare. Uh, they're they're going to launch it on November the 1st, which is before the Disney service, which was announced to, uh, to launch around Thanksgiving. They're charging only $4.99 a month versus $6.99 for Disney or $12.99 for their uh, premium version with Hulu or $12.99 for, for Netflix. Uh, they're making a huge commitment in content. They're going to spend over $6 billion in content. In fact, they're trying to create a whole category of what they call prestige TV. And so what they're doing is also making it really easy for consumers. Uh, families can, can be on the plan, up to six people with their own ID and password. And if you buy an Apple device, so they're encouraging to be involved in the Apple ecosystem, an iPad, an iPhone, uh, a computer. You get the service for free. So it gives you a great trial opportunity because they're a little bit behind everybody else. They don't have the content, but they're going to start with nine series. They're going to add at least a series every month, and they're going to scale up really fast. And, and, and Apple has a lot of loyal consumers and customers, um, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to look at Apple as a streaming alternative. Yeah, those streaming services certainly seem to be the way of the future. We've definitely talked about it more than once here on the Friday Business Report. Now, moving on to a little bit of a different subject, let's talk about Zillow. I heard that the real estate website is offering to buy homes directly from sellers. How does that work? Yeah, they have a new uh, service called Zillow Offer. It's, it's in 16 markets already. San Diego is the newest market, and it's pretty simple. You can go online, uh, submit, answer some questions, submit a, a form. Within two days, you'll get a no-obligation offer to buy your home, and you can close it as quickly as five days to 90 days. So potentially very attractive, but they charge a service fee. So unlike a broker commission, which is around 5 to 6%, they're going to charge 7.5%. If you're a, you know, you have the money, you can do the upgrades. It's better to go with a real estate agent if you're in a desirable neighborhood because you could probably get more money than you would from Zillow. There are a lot of companies who are doing this already. Uh, there's a couple of companies called, uh, one is called OfferPad, one is called uh, Open Door. Open Door has already bought 10,000 houses around the country. They're just not in San Diego yet. Um, with Zillow, they've already purchased about 3,000 homes. So uh, it's a big deal. Yeah, pretty fascinating stuff, I think. From the seller's perspective, that convenience factor could be an incentive for sure. And let's move on to, this was a huge talker this week, AB5, big news here in California. Uh, tell us a little bit more about this bill and how it might change things for gig economy workers and companies like Uber and Lyft. Yeah, this is a really complex bill that may have unintended consequences, but the gist of it is that um, for a long time, um, there's been this fraying relationship between employers and employees. Employers are looking for contract workers. They're offloading uh, the benefit costs, the, the, co the employer costs of Social Security and Medicare to employees. So the net take-home package in many cases is a lot less. And so employees have said, look, the, we should be employees. The Supreme Court ruled narrowly uh, the state of California in favor of classifying these employees, uh, these gig contract workers as employees. So the legislature has followed suit. All these workers that they have that are working for um, you know, 40 hours or more, should become employees, they get a minimum wage, they get some benefits, and it's a really positive thing. It might reduce some flexibility for workers. So now if I'm committed, I'm an employee for one company, if I'm a, a Uber driver and I drive for Lyft or other ride-sharing services, I really can't do that. Um, additionally, the, the, the major issue is that it really can impact the way companies do business. All of a sudden, if Uber and Lyft have to take on 20% additional costs on increased benefits or paying Social Security and, and Medicare taxes, that's going to substantially impact the way they do business. Um, other companies that will be affected are companies like Google and Facebook. They hire thousands of contractors who work full-time on their businesses, uh, developers, programmers, and whatnot. Uh, they will also be affected. So industry has been really wary of this bill, uh, but there's, there's a big disconnect because the cost of living in California is so relatively high. And if an individual who then is seen as a self-employed individual has to pay out all these costs, living in California becomes much more challenging. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to watch to see how it all shakes out. Well, Miro Kopik, thanks so much for breaking down all these complex <laughs> topics as usual. Uh, Miro Kopik from SDSU and Bottom Line Marketing. Thank you. Thanks, Priya. California's controversial new law affecting gig workers heads to Governor Newsom's desk. Big development plans okayed for Mission Valley and the race to replace Susan Davis in the 53rd Congressional District. Join us for the KPBS Roundtable tonight at 8.30.
It will be a rare sight in the sky tonight. Friday the 13th coincides with a full moon. And since it's the full moon closest to the autumnal equinox, it's known as the harvest moon. It gets its name because it provides extra light in the evenings, extending the harvest time for farmers. The last harvest moon was Friday the 13th. That was in October of 2000. And as far as the weather, we can expect things to stay warm through the weekend. Aaron Calandra has the latest forecast. Well, we are seeing some pretty nice conditions here in San Diego County. We are going to see a warm up and then it's going to cool down by the end of the week because of a storm coming on in further to the north of us. Taking a look right now, the satellite, it's quiet, not much going on here or really anywhere in California. Now, by midweek, we will see a storm coming on in to uh, the Pacific Northwest. We're going to see rain spreading south throughout California this week. So for tonight, we're at 66 degrees, a moonlit sky. We have an offshore flow, so we're not seeing that marine layer, and that's allowing our temperatures to increase. For tonight, Oceanside 59 for the low, Ramona at 58 degrees. In the mountains, we'll see a temperature close to 60, and Borrego Springs clear at 78. Tomorrow, expect to see hot, hot conditions, especially in the deserts. Once you get closer to the coast, of course, the Pacific keeps us on the cooler side, but our temperatures, they are going to be above average. We're talking 83 in San Diego. That's a warm day. Oceanside at 84. Lots of sunshine again with that offshore flow. We're not going to see our typical morning clouds. In uh, Ramona, 99 for the high temperature, flirting with 100 degrees. So make sure you're staying cool. Drink some water. Borrego Springs at 110 in Mount Laguna coming in at 83 with sunny skies. Over the next couple of days, the coast is looking good. Temperatures again into the 80s by Wednesday. That's when you'll notice a cooler pattern. Temperatures dropping back down to the 70s, closer to where they should be. Inland will be up to the 90s much of the weekend. And then slowly we start to cool down. It's going to remain sunny, 84 by Wednesday. And in the deserts, we're in the triple digits through the weekend. Again, sunny and hot. And then as we approach the work week, our temperatures will slowly drop into those upper 90s. And in the mountains, well, we go from the 80s down to the 70s. The coolest day of the week will be on Tuesday with a high of only 72 degrees. For KPBS News, I'm Erin Calandra. Back to you. And that, of course, is singer Eddie Money, who died today at his home in Westlake Village, known for a number of big hits in the 70s and 80s, like Two Tickets to Paradise, Take Me Home Tonight, Baby Hold On. Money also appeared recently in a reality TV show about his family. He is reported to have died of cancer of the esophagus. Eddie Money was 70 years old. After six seasons broadcasting to TV audiences here on KPBS, Downton Abbey appears on the big screen next week. CNN's Neil Curry sat down with the members of the cast to talk about the show and the new movie. After six seasons exporting English etiquette to TV audiences around the world, the everyday tale of banquets and butlers is taking silver service to the silver screen. No maid, no valet, no nanny even. It's 1927. We are modern folk. I think there's a fascination with everyone around the world with the British royal family. So I think a lot of people are tuning in for that sort of, you know, we're an extension of that, I guess. The king and queen are coming to Downton. What? In drawing rooms from Toronto to Tokyo, Downton's aristocratic agenda appeals to both women and men. Some DJ started a Downton... Abbey Man Club or something, and everybody would phone, all, they'd get all men to phone in from their trucks on the edge of a, a motorway service station saying, oh yeah, I love watching it and it's great, and I cried when such and such happened. I need your help, Carson. I'll be there in the morning, my lady. Don't you worry. Characters such as Mr. Carson have inspired the kind of devotion usually reserved for superheroes. I've had several puppies and a baby named Carson. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, a, a and, good and a picture of a baby dressed as a butler with silver all around it rather dangerously. Do you have enough cliches to get you through the visit? 
If not, I'll come to you. Oh, here we go. Whips from countesses and tiffs between toffs compete for attention with the affairs of footmen and butlers below stairs. And with a feast of familiar faces, there have already been calls for a follow-up film. A royal luncheon, a parade, and a dinner. I'm going to have to sit down. I think if you ask the uh, the audience to compare so a sequel with uh, Mrs. Patmore's puddings, they'd they'd all like another helping. Would would you like another helping with this nice. movie? Nice. Oh, that's so nice. I did that. And the answer is yes. <laughs> I would. Yeah. We'd love it. Yeah. But I don't want another helping of Mrs. Patmore's puddings <gasps> because you're terrible. As long as the audience, our loyal TV audience, yeah. gets out of its armchairs and goes to the cinema and, and enjoys this first one, um, then, uh, yeah, why not? I think there's if an appetite. If they leave a clean plate. If I they leave a clean plate, yeah, yeah, yeah. If they finish okay. all their first helping of Mrs. Patmore's pudding, then, of course, we shall have second <laughs> oh, helpings. Well said. Why not? Well yeah. said. Set in an era untroubled by Brexit, Downton has been credited with a boost in British tourism, a welcome economic export from the epicentre of English etiquette. Your Majesties, welcome to Downton Abbey. Neil Curry, CNN, London. And as always, you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. And we end the show with music from Live at the Belly Up, which airs tonight at 11 on KPBS. Thanks for joining us tonight. Have a great evening.